I'm playing you. Um, the next steps. Yeah, well, we, you know, it's 20 to 12, so I, I look to the board, the chair here. So what, All right. <laughs> which should be the what, next steps? What, what are the next steps before, now in January? Well, I mean, one next step that's just super easy is we'll, we'll, you know, survey you all about another meeting date and time. <laughs> that, that's but pretty straightforward. Do we, do, do we need can we get a, can, maybe a consensus about direction from the body so that... Yeah, but, so that's the harder yeah, next yeah. step. So <laughs> what I, Sorry. I can, Sorry. The, the easy one that we can, like, knock out pretty quick is setting up another meeting. But what do you want staff to do for that meeting? What direction do you want us to go in? What do you, so I heard looking, um, doing a survey of the literature to look for... Um, what's kind of out there for treatment of chronic pain, doing a survey of other payers to look for anyone that has already done some of this work and, you know, to see if, if that's available. Um, there, there is some. And then I also heard maybe querying, Tracy, we also have something we call the all-payer, all-claims database, um, which we could survey, you know, who's the highest utilization, what are their diagnoses, and um, maybe get some... It, kind of get informed a little bit by that. So those are some concrete tasks. Is that all Medicaid? All payer, all? Jason, what is on the all, all payer, all claims? All payer. All payer. It's all payer? So wow. It does not include uh, Medicare fee-for-service. Yeah. I believe it does have Medicare Advantage and commercial, commercial insurance. But there are limitations to that data, and we have to ask and see how much we can get. It's, I'm, Jermaine, to this, is CMS still pushing to go away from fee for service to alternative payment models? Just a, it's a piece of the pie. Yeah, the next sure. meeting is the CPC uh -huh. Plus, which is Comprehensive Primary Care Plus, which is a Medicare uh, alternative payment strategy that Oregon is participating in with most of the CCOs. That's great. I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time hearing that. Can you repeat that last piece? Sorry. Um, Oregon is participating in CPC Plus, which is a um, Medicare alternative payment uh, program um, that's trying to move away from the plain fee for service. So this is Kim. What I think I heard that I would be really excited about is to see our own data, break the, wherever the natural breaks are in the data, maybe there'll be quartiles about diagnoses and high utilizers and what those services are that they're utilizing. But if we look at natural breaks, what we might find over time is that where we have the most traction and can get the most help is with the mildly effective or it's the moderately effective. So, um, you know, I think not, not looking at everybody equally, but looking at where those natural breaks are. So I think it sounds like at the end of the day, the nation's going to look to us and go, Oregon, what are you doing and what's the database you're using to support that? So if we have these data, we should at least see what the breaks are right now. And this is Nora. Um, were you referring to the, the data that's being collected from CORE? I'm pointing at Tracy's uh, iPad. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I think there's data that we can ask the CCOs for. There's data um, that we can ask the um, Medicaid program for, there's some other databases, there's some limitations, we have to kind of, you know, we, we just can't go and like mess around in their data, we have to ask specific questions. But, but, um, because uh, the core group is based in Providence through Bill Wright, when we started implementing the vaccine guidelines, they began to run some numbers on utilization of services based on that new change, and that might be a place that we'd want to look as well. Yeah. There's another piece I just want to throw out. This is Ambrose. Um, it, it, it's kind of along the lines of unintended consequences, um, and, and I know nobody in this group would fall in this, but there are a lot of providers who don't believe the people who are in chronic pain. That's true. Um, and so there are a lot of people who persistent pain, chronic pain, whatever, do not go to providers. And then they show up in the system way down the road when they have, like somebody was saying, diabetes, heart disease, ER visits, um, where they then take a bunch more resources um, because, they, because they hadn't trusted 
the, the system to help them with their with their health. I'm just wondering if there's any um, research out there around like histories of people who like show up at the toward the end of life, taking up a lot of resources, who may have been experiencing pain in their life but have not been who have gone untreated for the most part. This is Jason. If we can ask a specific question of the data, we're going to do a lot better than right. if we say we want data on high utilizers. Right. So, what is can that somebody try to frame ask? one of the questions or a couple of questions? So, I can. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. It's always harder on the phone. Um, yeah, so uh, my question would be um, histories of people who show up in the system. Um, with uh, diseases such as diabetes or heart disease uh, that would be a result of maybe an inactive lifestyle due to chronic pain. This is Kim. I think, I think, yeah, I think that's an incredibly ambitious and wonderful project and maybe that's the step that we should take a little later. And maybe, maybe the step we should take now is identifying the people in the system that currently have chronic pain and what their comorbidities are and what their utilization patterns are, looking again for natural breaks in the data to figure out how to categorize them. Friendly yeah. amendment to that, Kim, would be okay. what kind of utilization are you talking about? Primary care visits, specialized visits. Uh, can we look at uh, prescription drug costs associated with those folks? Can we look at ED visits? and hospitalizations associated with those. So that would be a five-factoid process. Well, I think that that all goes back to the ACEs study with the 17,000 people that Kaiser did, too, and, and how poorly people have uh, fared the multiple traumas that they have. And that this whole trauma-informed care that we're all doing is really where we need to be for the state to prevent these downstream issues and cost-cutting. Okay, so where do we go from here? Um, do we need to come up with a... We so the next steps I have um, is number one, set up another meeting. Two, query data on high utilizers, looking at the, both the diagnosis and the services being utilized, although I think we're still, haven't quite still defined the question, made. so I don't know if that's something yeah, It that might be good to have a few people who are more data-oriented Maybe meet with the staff if we can identify an analyst and, and kind of try to bring together. Because these discussions, if you just throw it over the wall to the yeah. analyst, you'll get something that won't be useful. Yeah. And it needs to be somebody that knows this particular data set inside out. So we know who's the terms to Yeah, so we want to meet with the analyst who knows the computer code and then somebody from this group who knows the problem and just kind of talk back and forth. That's the best way to get meaningful information. And this has, this is Kim, has this been done in the back pain world or not? We did, we did a limited poll before the back pain, and we discovered, for example, of the people with the back pain diagnosis, some huge percentage of them were on chronic opioids for an average of 166 days supply per year. And it was costing like $50 million just was, for the opioids. Was, yeah. And they had this many ED visits. And so we did something like that. But it w That's wasn't, when you're talking about slicing in predictors, it becomes a magnitude more complex, so. I mean, you could do a simple thing of find me your 100 highest utilizers, give me their diagnoses and their CPT codes, and then we wade through it. Mm -hmm. And it could be something as... It, yeah, yeah, that can, be, that can be a first step, but you'll often want to go two or three steps beyond that. Right. It depends how much resource mm -hmm. you can get. So I can offer... Uh, a snapshot and we just have to recognize this is my CCO so and I can talk about the data that we do have and maybe just email out to the group just some stats so you know I can say that of my 20,000 patients if I look at my top 10% who are likely to have avoidable costs um, my number one diagnosis is substance related disorders the problem with that is that a lot of the screening codes that went along with ESPERT 
fall into that category. So we have to understand some of those. But I can put together a snapshot. Um, and it will be diagnosis driven because again, these are based on sure. claims. But I can give us something to start with. Yeah, it could be I think the policy board did some work like this a few years ago too. Maybe we can drop that. Do we also need to do any research on, um, you know, we had all Roger Chow's stuff for the low back pain and the evidence supporting that. Do we need to do other deeper dive on complex pain and um, in our recommendations? Yeah, I mean, there must be th things out there. So yeah. that, that was my, my third step, was to survey the literature for what's out there for chronic pain, um, complex pain, chronic pain. That If anyone has any... I, I may need some, you know, medline's only as good as what you, the search terms you put in. Um, but I can search that, and then I can also search through other payers. Um, one of the things we can also do is we, um, we are part of a program called the Med Project, which is, um, I don't know, 17 or so of, those of the Medicaid programs get together, and we can ask them questions, and we can ask them, like, what policies do you have about chronic pain? So we could, we could do something like that. Um, it's you know a snapshot of a few Medicaid programs, but um, and then I also heard, but probably as a secondary step, looking at less high utilizers, how to prevent sort of conversion to chronic pain. But that might be a next step. Or even those with chronic pain that are not high utilizers. Mm -hmm. And just to throw this, out. Um, this is Nora. Um, I, I'm interested too in in it seems like, and this gets to the idea of you know that Medline is only as good as the questions you put in. Um, that there may be some evidence based treatments that are getting missed. Like I, I think it's curious that naturopathic care hasn't been on the radar and yet seems to be very helpful for. And I don't. I am not familiar with the evidence. Um, for that body of work, but certainly seems to be very helpful for people and as well occupational therapy. So, um, and then pain education um, itself wasn't one of the things that showed up, and I know that there's very good evidence for pain education itself as a treatment intervention. So, um, how can we help uh, broaden the, the scope? Should we send you? Searchable terminology. Sure. Hey, Nora, just to point out, patient education is actually at the top of yeah. Ariel's <laughs> list here. It's important factors to consider for the Yes, patient. I know, I, I saw that. Yeah, but when we first got the, we're doing the back pain line, um, there was some discussion of that, but it was referring to. Right. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> we've learned. Come a long way. All but, right, so. Kevin, you have just one more really, thing? Really quick, but it may not be super quick. It's just, what's the vision, though? I mean, what's, what, what are we trying to achieve here? I mean, that overall, because we've talked a lot about a lot of different things, what's the old, what, are, what is the, the one thing that we're trying to achieve with this task force? We, we would like a, we would like to cover OHP patients who have some sort of chronic complex pain with a limited number of evidence-based effective services and limit any ineffective Oops. services. Was there, was to there, improve outcomes so that the services that have that might be impacted in their effectiveness by somebody's experience of pain, such and, as somebody who has surgery and they don't cover that doesn't help their knee pain, doesn't improve their mobility because right. they have a complex picture. So mm -hmm. it's to improve the outcomes of, of all of those. Improve functionality, improve pain scores, improve ability to treat other conditions. I mean there's yeah. So is decreased I'll, cost across the state? Is that a marker, you know, metric? Or we always like decreasing yeah. cost. <laughs> and it's a good question to ask as far as the metrics and how we're going to measure success for making these kind of changes. Do we have the ability to look at our database around the quality adjusted life years and those sort of metrics, or is that beyond? Yeah, nothing in the database. Claims. <laughs> What were you going to add, Darren? Um, what was I going to say? Uh, shoot. Um, and are we assuming? Oh, the metrics. I'm sorry. Are we assuming that back pain also can be chronic pain? So a lot of the work that's already been done, we can just put into this to this pie. 
some. I mean, back pain ended up involving a whole bunch of procedures and surgeries and um, specifics there. But in terms of medical treatment of back pain, yeah, there's there's some some framework there. Okay, just to, so we don't we can start from somewhere. Mm -hmm. So it's like to develop a coverage plan for OHP members that uh, is both evidence based and effectively addresses the needs of that individual where they are in the state of their health. I mean, so, I mean yeah. that's the ultimate goal. We're trying to get people better in a cost-effective manner, but we want to meet them where they are mm -hmm. rather than wait for them to get to the right. tail. And, and, and the reason I'm just asking is because we can get all granular, and, but we have to know what the ultimate goal is that we're trying to achieve. And um, you know, I just see that is we're ultimately the goal is to improve the health of OHP members, and we're going to do that through X mission statement. So, I mission, mission statement. statement. Oh, maybe we can one of those together. And decreasing the iatrogenic effects of our medical system. It's causing more complex pain. <laughs> okay. So, um, no, my question was about metrics. Do we need to have outcome measures as far as... Well, I, I, not, that's I think, a whole other discussion. I think what I was going to say is, um, over my years with the state, there's been uh, little done in the way of evaluation um, after we're done. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I certainly think, you know, as a part of the whole triple aim, we want to also, um, while we improve health and patient experience, also do so in, in managing costs as much as possible. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's likely that there will necessarily be a study at some for, point. For, for back pain, we actually had to get outside groups to get grants. So that we've, somebody finally did get a grant, and they're going to be studying the impacts of the back changes. Do we have data to look at the quadruple aim pull in the provider, or do we just have patient data? Just patient. And I can tell you what the experience of my <laughs> provider network is. Yeah. I'll say that um, just uh, having heard from around the state is that the impact of the low back pain lines, uh, there are still people trying to figure it out and, and um, figure out how to refer and access and things like that that we're all working on. But the commercial payers are actually jumping on to it and for, are paying for the services. So that was our also our other intent is that it might become more mainstream to actually integrate more multidisciplinary and more effective kind of team-based care for these complex patients. Yeah, and anecdotally, what I heard from providers was that they were really happy with the back changes They because they felt kind of tied. They didn't have things to offer, and now they had things that they were at least able to, you know, have available for people. And whether, you know, then they had new frustrations how to get certain things to work, but at least I think. So yes. for our perspective, you wrote down a whole list of things that, um, who's doing that work? Is it us, or is it? So Tracy's going to help um, feed in some data. Yeah, and then yeah, maybe we could set up a meeting with you and staff, and we can maybe work on how to how to take whatever data you get and ask the bigger system sort of the same, like maybe have you that be the the test project to develop the questions. Um, so staff will sort of do as much as we can looking at um, the data. And then the literature survey, um, I mean, I, I will probably do that, and I may ask for help from some certain from people. If you know of anything, if, if any of you know of literature or of another payer, please send it to me. Um, and then I will do that search and see what I can find. Um, and then um, we, as, a, as staff, will... Um, so Kat Livingston is the other medical director. She is the one who's sort of our med project person. So we'll see how she can get this into the med project uh, pot of questions. Um, so we'll take we'll we'll look at that. So I guess the the job for you all, um, Tracy has her own special job. Um, the other job would be if, if any literature that you're aware of or that you run across, please send. If you have, um, if you are in the shower tomorrow morning and you are like, this is the question we should ask, you know, send that to staff. Mm -hmm. um, after you get out of the shower. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no electrocution oh, in the shower. Yeah. yeah. So uh, instead, those want evidence based best practice kind yeah. of articles. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. So yeah. anything that you have that's evidence based best practices, or if you run across another payer having some sort of a, mm -hmm. you know, guideline set of whatever, um, I'm thinking the one of the things we used. It, for the back pain was the Washington, um, the Washington State uh, Workers' Comp 
they actually had really comprehensive things that we borrowed chunks of. <laughs> um, so you know, I will look through those, but if any of you run across any of those, please send them. Um, that Should they go to you or you and Jason? Or who? You, so there's something called HERC Info at OHA. So it's, it's HERC Info at state.or.us. That's just a generic. It's, so it's HERC dot info. HERC, H E R C dot I N F O. Mm -hmm. And that will just that just is a generic email. It will come to the group and be sent to whoever needs it. That's You're also email. just HERC dot info at state.or.us. And then at the very last slide of the slide deck is all of our email addresses. Um, and you're welcome. If you send it to somebody and it turns out to be the wrong person, we will find the... So the, the top one? So the DHS OHA will get it to us faster, but if you leave that part out, it will still eventually find its way to our mailbox. So DHS OHA gets it to you faster? I don't know. It's the same. <laughs> it's probably the same. I don't know. Oh, no, I thought it was a mistake and I avoid using those addresses. No, it's not. Many ways to reach us. Okay. Yeah, so, um, yeah, DHS added that a little while ago. We don't know why. I guess maybe it's something to do with the server. I don't know. And did we need to vote today on number one or two option, or is that still going to be digesting digesting for the next? I didn't hear any specific movement in one way or the other. Mm -hmm. I heard that you all feel like you need more data before you can move forward. So, yeah. is that some reason? Okay. David, did you have something else? I like, no, chomping at the bit. Digesting. Okay. Did we find a time to ask based off on that? No. no. So um, probably um, uh, one of our staff will send out sort of the same thing we did last time for the Google poll. Okay. It'll probably come from Daphne Peck. It may come from one of the other. other. And so you'll, it'll just be a poll of days and times. It's like, and you just say when you're available. And we do apologize. We, we pick what is the best for the majority. And if you can't make it, you know, hopefully you can make the next one. Can you send, uh, this is Amber Rose, can you send out the PowerPoint that I was looking at um, and uh, the email that then uh, the information to? Amber Rose, that was in the meeting materials? That was in the meeting materials that were sent out prior to the meeting. If you click the link there and go to our meetings page, that's available on our website. This I didn't hear that. So the meeting materials, including the PowerPoint, um, and the roster for the subcommittee are, are published on our website. Thank you, everybody, for participating. Yes, thank Have you a good day. This is exciting. I'm so excited. This is great. This is great. Thanks, everybody. What a different conversation than when oh was God. that, three yeah. years ago? Three years ago. Oh, yeah. The back stuff? Yeah. It's different in, uh, I think it's different because the back well, it's, it's so much further down. Yeah. The so I, I don't, I, if you say this, struggle around I think it's thinking like about this stuff in a different mm -hmm. way. People are more on the same page. Mm -hmm. So we haven't had a chance to figure out what works. That's a good question. It has. Why? 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 Sometimes oh, people start using that in my email and they can't get hold of it. So it's in that first list of people. Yeah, that's what you should have You do have it in some places. Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, you actually have it in my email. You have it on the thing over there. Right. But in, in, I think it may have been in the Boston. Yeah. 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 Okay. I will make sure that yeah. that gets. There's something else that people start spelling my name on the email. Yeah. 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 Ye
You know, treat patients, patients are it's subjective pain, just treat whatever they tell you. There's no well, other limit. People won't well, get addicted. And that, yeah. That was pretty scary. No, I came into the, when I came into the commission, I actually, uh, having been in doing rehab, pain rehab for years, um, you know, rehab and PT, some IT and all that. It's like, it's all kind of so how you just living and I said, you know, you know uh, Gary Franklin up there at L and I, he's talking about this opioid epidemic. Yeah. Labeling, he was the first one really to label it. And I, 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 we were like, oh, that's just, that's yeah. baloney. And, uh, but I was like almost booed out of the room. Well, yeah, it was come up, well, that's come out in the last few years, is that all the internal drug company documents. Oh, oh, right. The drug companies yeah. knew. Yeah, they literally knew uh -huh. that they like the. Um, there was a huge push. I mean, as a resident, like there was all these like dress. Like I would go to seminars where they talk about like when a patient gets over a certain amount of short acting, you need to transition to long acting. Right. Yeah. I remember better. those ones too. But then internal documents at the drug companies say like they knew that the long acting didn't last that long. Right. Wow. So they knew they were far more addictive because they would come off. You would actually go into withdrawal. Yeah. And they as well as having pain, and then you take another dose and you would know, withdraw and everything go away. Do you want to talk to Ariel? I just want to say thanks for having me. Um, oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So, so, so there was yeah, thanks. Some, uh, some intentional. Right. Like, I mean, who knows? Oh, yeah. Well, that's why I'm putting that all on.